Okay, we're back. This is part two of Las Vegas Then and Now with Lenny Del Genio. All right, in part one, we talked about the Wild West times when you moved here in 67 all the way up through the late 70s. Now, when was your next sports book or sports betting type experience? Well, uh, I had wanted to make more money in the casino industry. And to do that, I had to work through the casino in a number of management positions. That allowed me to interface with the presidents, at the time the general manager of properties, some chairmen of the board. That opened the door where they, they allowed me to participate in meetings. Given that entree and the background that we discussed earlier about limos taking your high-end plays to other casinos, I prepared a P&L and a business plan with Bobby Grigorka for Summa Corporation. We presented it, it went all the way to the board of directors and was shot down. Three months later, there's a new board of directors. Mr. Cox takes over as chairman of the board. He wants to make sure that everybody's on the page that they're gonna sell the properties and they're gonna make them competitive. I dust off the old business plan and the marketing plan made the, the changes. Again, Bobby and I presented it to our executives, uh, uh, John Miner and, and Jerry Anderson, at the Frontier. They bought it. We uh, were then allowed, we met with Michael Roxborough, who was running Las Vegas Sports Consultants. All right, then. so now what year is this? That's, uh, it's in the 80s, you know, to be exact. I, my memory gets bad no with worries, dates now, no but worries. it's in the early 80s. Okay. okay, now Roxy Roxborough, you know, is what he's known by, was, now he didn't find, he wasn't the founder of Las Vegas Sports Consultants, right? It was Bob Martin first. Well, Bob Martin always was behind the scenes, even when Roxy owned it. Okay. Because Bob Martin come from a different background, and at that time, gaming control started to, enforce rules and regulations. So Roxy was a transitional uh, person where he went from the good, and, and to some degree, Bob Gregorka and myself were, we went from pre-corporation where guys with vowels and broken noses were running the joints to corporate structure. And Roxy did the same thing at Las Vegas Sports Consultants. Now, Bob Martin, uh, he, he gained a lot of publicity at the time as the oh, guy yeah. that made the line, and I think Sports Illustrated did some stuff with him. Sure. Is, did you have any dealings with him? Of very, very, very little dealings with him. I was probably too naive at the time to probably understand exactly what he was doing. The big part of him was he knew where the line was going to go because he had high-end players betting into his numbers before they opened. This is before the starters in the lottery. Okay. So you have to go back and understand why his numbers were so strong. He would allow individuals to bet with him, and he had a solid number that then the next day went out to all of the books and actually across the whole country. So he was, a, he was a smart man. These guys come from a background where there were, you know, none of us are virgins. And these guys surely were significantly ahead of their time with the way they analyzed information. But the key to any bookmaker is he will book off of the money that's bet into him to get to the number that's the right number. Okay. So he minimizes his loss by allowing you, RJ, to bet in before the public, he then knows which way the line is going to go, and he can make the modifications and during the booking. Learned, the whole concept of the lottery was we're going to have the initial early bets come in in a controlled fashion at a, a, at a modest limit that's going to allow us to touch these numbers up before the whole world can bet in. Yeah, and it. even that became um, uh, not exactly what people thought. There were ways to uh, get pre-lottery numbers. There were ways to and why don't we it. let's hold that because I think the Stardust Lottery we can do a whole segment sure. on because uh, that's something that really has a lot. E even when I really dug into this in the late '90s, is that was famous and it was sure. something that was meaningful at the time. Well, <clears throat> it's going to be interesting talking about the differences now versus uh, or then versus now with you know, Chris and, and, and Greek opening first, and now with our, you know, your friend, and you introduced me to him, Johnny Avello, he's opening stuff at the wind now, even before offshore. Yeah. It's really interesting, the differences now to then. But let's do a segment on that. Right. All right, so you were at the Frontier, you were amongst the core group pitching to have a sports yeah. book. 
And, um, and we went from there to being allowed to put it in. We put in a small book. Uh, at that time, I became involved, well, actually before that, with NARASO, Nevada Association of Race and Sports Book Directors. I don't know where they got the name, but it was guys like Ray Lindsay. It was every person that you've read about were members of this association. And I became treasurer because I was the new kid on the block. And it went from there to learning an awful lot. These guys became my graduate school. They helped so you were, us. You were the younger of the group. I was, I was the, uh, even though age-wise I wasn't that much younger than them, I was the kid uh, because I, trans I was able to transition from the bookmaker on the corner to the corporate uh, boardroom. And you knew how to navigate Yeah, and I had enough education to do it, and I was, I'm, I'm not easily intimidated by anything. So it's funny because you get a lot of people saying, oh, I wish I had this opportunity, I wish I had that opportunity. But you're telling me literally you were on the cutting edges. The books were starting to pop up in the properties. And you said, I'm going to write me and my partner or partners. We're going to write a business plan, mm -hmm. go to the owner of the hotel and say, we want to run a book. And that's a kind of initiative that most people that lament not having opportunities don't have. Well, you know, we always, uh, my goal all through life was not only to knock on the door, but to get in. And I would force my way in. Now, I, thank God I had a personality and still do to some degree that was moderately aggressive but not offensive. So people, I knew when to bring up subjects and when to back away. When the executive in charge made the decision, I could take that decision on my shoulders as my own. So was there luck involved? Of course. But more important than luck was preparation. The treasury, treasurer of Narasa was important. The parley card exper expertise was important. The hanging around with the Scotty Schentlers and, and um, Ray Lindsay's and Brandy's and Sonny Reisner's, all of those guys was very important because that all, you could call them up, hey, th what do you think about this? And coming from the casino end of it was very important. It brought a new perspective to how we could do things out of a race in sportsbook. Now, would you say that you sought out mentorships uh, or mentors with these people? It sounds like you saw, hey, they're a little bit oh. older, they're, they've got experience I don't. It's, it seems like you really, like a sponge, try to soak that up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I needed, and Bobby needed, we associated ourselves with the smartest people around. When we, excuse me, <clears throat> when we established the team at the Frontier, we had Bobby Davis, ex-general manager of the Rose Bowl, we had Robert Smith, who's now with Leroy's. So is Bobby Davis. Robert Smith, ex-general manager for Gary Austin. We had Sidney Callahan, ex-bookmaker from New Orleans. We had Robert Goodgorker and myself. We had a team where we had wonderful expertise and some thought processes of how we could use that expertise and take it you know, they say take it to the next level. But in reality, that's what we help to do. And what's interesting is back then, if you were in Florida or Ohio or, or Harlem still, you would have had no chance to interact with these people, no. the Vegas people. The beauty of today, look at a guy like you with all these decades of experience, but through the magic of videotaping, we're putting this on paper or putting this on digitized format for anyone anywhere to watch. Yeah, you're making a history. And true, and, but additionally, we'll give, and that's kind of the whole pregame.com concept, is we aggregate all this information that even 20 years ago you would have had to been there, but now yeah. you can sit in your bedroom and still enjoy the, it. The team is always better than the individual. That's true. And absolutely. And the bookmaking team that we had at the frontier at that time, I would put up against anybody because it had expertise, it had street knowledge, and it had a blend where everybody was equal at the decision-making table. So once this came to culmination and things were rolling, what was the frontier known for? So if I would have hit town at this point and, and talked to a guy that really knew sports books, what would they have said? They would have said, Stardust has got the opening line, Frontier does this. Oh, how, how would it we, have been we characterized? Did, we, we then, other people had done future books on both the Kentucky Derby and Breeders' Cup. Remember, the Breeders' Cup was just starting then. I mean, people forget what world we live in. Bob Gregorka and his team put together all the future books on horse racing. 
gave us an instant credibility sorry, in that. Sorry to interrupt, Lenny, but at this point, what percentage of your action was horses? What percentage was sports? At that time, it was uh, pretty even, uh, maybe even more, maybe 60% racing and 40% sports. Then we decided to do something a little different. Um, we decided to change the VIG, the $1. ten to win a dollar. We, we decided to bet, give you two bets for a $1.05. If you bet one at a dollar ten, then you got the other for a dollar five. Oh, that's interesting. So no one had done that yet. No one, none of the things that you see being done today were done, and we we were very lucky that we had a, a great a man, Sonny Reisner, working with us, who thought we were crazy, who thought you couldn't do this, and wrote a letter that we then got his permission to use as an advertisement. Sonny Reisner says they're crazy. And that turned the, that we were already headed down a good road, but that turned the page because at that time, then everybody had to come in to the frontier to see what we were doing. And we decided to do a lot of things that no one had done because there was this unwritten, at that time, an unwritten law that you couldn't change the VIG. You couldn't change the, the PC on your parlays. We did all of that. And really, Barbara Gorka was instrumental in coming up with these so, concepts. So this letter that you're crazy was you're offering too much value to the oh, client. Oh, yeah. And, and quite candidly, one of the first people to make a bet was a guy named Frank Toady, who people in the industry will know as part owner of the Coast Casinos at that time, and also Michael Gaughan's right-hand man. So that happened. Frank comes to the counter, and he sees what the proposition is that we're putting out, and he says, you guys aren't too crazy. I like it. <laughs> and that was the first guy to make in a bet in there. And th that was a wonderfully pat on the back for both Bobby and I because Bobby had worked with him intimately over the years. So once you had the operations set up, you guys didn't stop there. You said, how can we be innovative? Absolutely. Which I think is missing in Vegas yeah. today. The only one guy, and you mentioned him earlier, Johnny Avello is the last. And, and, and again, from what I know, he's always fighting with the big wigs oh, I'm sure. to do what he wants to do. Because right now it's like, hey, we'll make our 3% on the, theor you know, the theoretical hold and be happy. And, you know, the nice thing is, and another guy we'll probably talk about a little bit, uh, another friend of pregame, Jimmy Vaccaro, he's trying to do some exciting stuff yeah. at Lucky's. But those are usually the, the rogues, the outlaws, trying to do Otherwise, it's like a bunch of accountants, you know, with, yeah. the, with their spreadsheet. As mu much as I like people who come out of accounting and people who have masters, uh, I have a fear that they're too well-educated to understand what the public wants. Almost similar to what politicians do sometimes. They think they know what the public want, but they've distanced themselves so far away from it that they really get hurt by it. All right, and actually, what we're going to do is take a break, but let's segue into the next topic after the break, which is let's talk about these old school guys. Most of them didn't have college degrees, didn't have masters. Oh, no. The question is what made them extraordinary and, and what, why is that lacking today? So this has been part two, and we're going to pick up in, with part three next.